Okay, at 6.30, let's call the March 9th meeting of the Sawyer County Health and Human Services Board meeting to order. Uh, roll call. Dale Schleter? Yep. Tweed Schumann? Here. Dale Olson? Here. Chuck Van Etten? Here. Don Pettit? Here. Noreen Gouget? Here. Jennifer Vabornik? Carol Pearson? Here. Dr. Sabrina Dunlap? Here. Okay, we do have a quorum certification compliance with open meeting law. This meeting has been noticed to the public and news media as required by section 19.84 of the Wisconsin statutes. Okay, meeting agenda, any changes, questions? Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion, a second. Okay. Who is the second? Tweet. Tweet. Thank you. Okay, everybody in favor say aye. 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 Motion, aye. motion passed. <coughs> Any comments? Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to say in reference to you know, personal recovery, uh, doing well. I mean, it's been being spot on a few times here. Uh, I was at, attended a uh, FK Society at the LCO Community College Day, close to that. And with, in reference to conscious communication and the system and the networking of computers, and I would say the you know, the reference of pandemic or the educational reference of the consciousness and the rehabilitation. Uh, I, I did a really good day today. I want to say on myself, but we, all those who were involved, one moment where I had some tension, where my mind had become vibrant, you know, I had to not to say ten, but I had to take a break for a moment because I'm walking away. But I'll be able to do so and I'll continue to go through my go through you know, my exercise. Continue to calm my nerves. And I know some of you think it's good day. And you know, it was a good day. That was, uh, it was a good day. It was a good day. It was a good conversation. Just considering my education that I had. So the agenda is minutes from previous meeting. Have a motion to approve. So, so by Mr. Olson, I'll second it. By Mr. Schumann. Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Motion is passed. Committee meetings. I'll see all the names on it. Yeah, I'm going to do the report that was handed in and I'll add to that. Um, the La Couturier Community Health Center, in partnership with the Elsa Tribal Governing Board and Sawyer County Health COVID-19 vaccinated 186 Hayward Community School District essential employees last Friday. LCO has approximately 400 children and even more attending the Hayward School District and we wanted to protect their children from COVID-19. We vaccinated approximately 240 tribal members, their families and essential workers the past two Wednesdays at the LCO Health Center with great success. We also will be vaccinating 240 more tomorrow, March 10th. Any tribal mem member, tribal family member, any essential worker 16 and older can call the health center at 715-638-5100 to schedule the vaccine appointment. 
it was just released recently that 16 and 17 year olds can now get the vaccination Pfizer vaccination so that we want to get that notice out to our community to inform them of that change. It is vitally important that community members be vaccinated even if they have had COVID-19 as a new variant strains of the virus post higher infection rate threats and those individuals who had COVID-19 may not be protected from the new strains without vaccinations. So we're encouraging that um, as much as we can. LCO Health Center had administered 2,100 COVID-19 vaccines to Pfizer or Moderna to date with no significant side effects. Side effects noted were treated with alternating Tylenol and ibuprofen every four hours for 24 to 48 hours. We currently have 1,000 prime vaccine doses to administer within the next 30 days, plus remaining Moderna boost doses. IHS assures us that, many, that any prime dose will be followed up with boost doses near the second vaccination date. So we make sure that we get that second dose in place. They also have stated that additional Pfizer and Moderna vaccine will be allocated weekly. Johnson Johnson vaccines will be available shortly. All three vaccines have emergency use authorization and have proven to be both effective and safe for use. As of yesterday, we had zero positive cases of COVID-19 in the LCO community, but we had one positive case today. We held a community COVID-19 testing last Monday at the 16th flex and found no positive cases. We are also seeing a downward trend in COVID-19 testing. It is important that we continue tests for COVID-19, especially when symptoms are present in order to quarantine and isolate to prevent further spread. Um, on the bright side, the CDC has released information stating those who have received primary and secondary COVID-19 doses post 14 days can remove masks and are not required to social distance from others who have had the same vaccinations and time frame since vaccination. Also, the Tribal Governing Board and LCO Health Center staff have agreed to donate to the Duluth, Minnesota Ronald McDonald House. They're starting that new house there. This is a very worthwhile charity organization which helps families deal with long-term care, health care expenses, including housing, travel, and meals. We encourage anyone interested to join this effort. So the tribe and the both are donating to that cause. The Tribal Governing Board has met with the LCO Health Center Management and began the early stage of planning to build a new health center and a new wellness center. The new health center is much needed as we have outgrown our current facility. The current facility is the oldest in the district, which includes Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So we're in the planning stages. Mm -hmm. Finally, the health and then the wellness center, we're looking at prevention, um, healthier lifestyle for all ages, and um, to keep emphasizing on those things that the quality of life. So we want to um, keep pursuing that also. Uh, finally, the LCO Health Center is pleased to announce we have a new contract the place for our medical director, Dr. Steve Miskowitz. I can't, I don't know how to say that. I call him Dr. Steve. He um, is at a clinic now, and while we're getting ready for our new clinic, we need to have uh, everything in order to, to be successful. So he's our medical director for the next three years. Um, this report was submitted by our LCO Health Director, Dr. Gary Gerard. And um, I also wanted to um, um, update things on some of the projects that we're working on. Um, we are addressing a broadband issue so that we can um, uh, move forward with having availability to our members and our community for telehealth, education, all the things that they need so that they will be able to, um, with this day and age where things are at, virtually with everything happening. They, they have a lot of families who don't have those abilities. So we want to make, we're pursuing that so we, we can outreach the community all the way around. Um, our transitional housing, we're still working on those projects um, so that we can help those who are coming home from treatment or those facilities that are getting care for and are coming home from institutions. Um, so that we could transition back into home, into the community. Um, we um, also have a food distribution program. I don't think I mentioned that last time. 
that we have had throughout this whole pandemic that we are trying to give uh, food to the community, to the members, so that we can get through this pandemic and to keep our people fed and take care of. Um, we also have a free polling store. I know we're in the process of moving the location of that, but we're trying to help those who don't have anything who need that support. So we want to continue those efforts too. So we're in the process of relocating that part, but um, it's there to help people who need that support. Um, we are continuing to provide that support needed for those who are battling with the addictions. And um, we have continued growth with community small group meetings, whether it be um, AA or uh, Variety or different groups that are happening so we can keep that support in place. Our, for our health center is back up to 50% to 75% operation, not fully yet, but we're working towards that. And um, we are still um, opening with, open with our schools so we can have as many there that can be there to continue learning but to keep them safe. And when we made that effort to reach out to the community all the way around, we have to protect our people the best we can. So that's why we're doing the things that we are. And um, we don't know what's coming yet. We still have yet to see what's coming our way. So we got to be ready for that as a community. So, um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Perfect. Is that it? Okay. That's it. I'm sure I'll say something wrong, inappropriate, but I, because I, I don't want to say the word partner, mm -hmm. but the tribe has been just fabulous through this entire process. And I thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I think it's been just wonderful how well you guys have responded to this. And, it, you know, not just as a partner, but a member of the community, as my neighbors, as whatever. Mm -hmm. It's, it, you should, you're doing flipping great. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Yeah. No, not you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is for, right now it's for board members only. Any other comments? I have my hand raised. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, please. Lorraine? Yeah? I think we need to back up about the CDC, uh, uh, about the masking. I don't believe that is exactly what is stated. It's uh, very limited where they can be at and who they can be with if they're not masked. It doesn't mean that they can be out in public. They have to still fo follow the uh, the CDC guidelines. The guidelines has not um, stated that you can walk around without a mask, that masks are not, uh, not being having to be used at the moment. They're still in, in fact saying that you should still mask up. So I don't want that to somebody to listen to this later and think, hey, I can go to work now and don't have to wear my mask because uh, as at the college and every other entity I know, they're still following the CDC guidelines that everybody, it's, you know, wash your hands, mask up, social distance, all of that. They, it's a very limited setting that they cannot have their mask on. Yeah, and I think but, Julia can speak on that also. Yeah, you are correct. And um, that was in reference to around those who were also vaccinated in smaller sessions. But yeah, you're right. We have to keep practicing those safety measures and keep those things in place. And the tribe still has that enforced also along with the state. But this was still progress. Yeah. We're, we're, we're moving forward. Yeah. And I did hear about that, listen to it. And it was pretty much directed at family gatherings. You know, if people have had the vaccine and done the two weeks after that, it's okay to go see your grandkids now. Yeah. So that's a big step. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And where are we? Senior Resource Center. I'm here, Dale. Okay, please go on. Okay, um, the first part of the report talks about the grants and funding and donations that we got in 2020. As you can see, we received a lot of donations and I wanna point out that the respite money, the bus money, 
and 6,500 of the 31,000 that we got for Hayward has been put into our Edward E. Jones account for when needed. The buses, um, the 10,000 that we've raised so far for the buses for a new bus, we are in the process. I'm working with John Swizzler at the DOT for a 53-1 50, uh, um, grant to possibly get a bus um, next year. They give out very few last year. They only gave out one um, grant for a bus last year. He did forward to me several proposals that they approved in the last couple of years as a template to use for our bus. If we are unable to get um, the 5310, then we'll have to do some major fundraising. This year, up through it, I don't know what the bill is for right now, but we've spent over $10,000 to keep our bus running. And right now, our bus has been out of commission for the last two and a half weeks, waiting on parts because it's aging. But um, Timber Ford was gracious enough to give us a van for us to use for our routes and Meals on Wheels. Unfortunately, we just were unable to take anybody that was in a wheelchair because this van does not have a lift. Um, all of the other donations for Spider Lake, Stone Lake, Winter, Excellent, and for the vets have been expended. The money that we got from the vets was in part from some money that the Sawyer County um, Register of Deeds Office um, received and and we're going to give it to um, the Veteran Center, but Gary said it would be better served to give it to us because we provide meals for a lot of different vets. So we use that money for Meals on Wheels for Vets this past year. I attached um, the meal count sheets. Um, we are in the process of switching to a new computer system at the Senior Center called My Senior Center. Not only will it um, do our bus routes, but it will also do our Meals on Wheels route. Our staff will no longer have to do their monthly Excel sheets. Everything will be put in on a daily basis. And at any one given time, any one of the administrators of the program would be able to go in and get a report. If someone would call and say, how many meals have you served so far this month on Meals and Wheels or people that dine in, we'd be able to give them that information immediately. We wouldn't have to wait until everything is in. It'll also help Shirley with the inclusion, and the iLife billing that she does. The sites are no longer doing their individual billing for iLife or Inclusa. We're doing that all out of the Hayward office because we have discovered in this past year, we have several sites that were not sending out the donation letters. And if they would have sent the donation letters out, we would have known that they were could have been paid for through iLife or Inclusa. So we have um, some cases where we've lost revenue for two or three years because site managers failed to send out donation letters. So we've got that remedied and this program will take care of all of those things. And we'll also do some minimal accounting, but it'll free up a lot of stuff that our site managers do, but pour and work, put more work on the secretary for a while until we get all of the data input. But everyone is excited about it. It was like about an eight month process before we decided to go with this program. Some of you may know that Excellent had some soot damage that should be cleaned up um, by this Friday and they should be able to reopen the following Monday after Brian Becker from Public Health comes and gives us his final approval that it's ready to go. Because um, Brian had been down there with me to let us know exactly what we had to do. We also in 2021 and 2022, it has been advised by both the state and public health that we will have to license all of our sites. So that's something that we're working with right now through Brian Becker, how we want to license all our sites. Up to this point, Hayward is the only site that had to be licensed because of the food truck. and We no longer have the food truck. But with that license, say, for example, someone would come to us and want us to do a meal for a funeral or something like that or a special party. That's where those licenses come into play. But statewide they're asking and looking at that all senior centers that serve food have a food license. So we're working on that process with Brian Becker. Um, in excellent Bonnie Becker, Bonnie Klinger will be retiring on um, actually uh, her official date is Good Friday, but it will be the day before. She has worked um, in excellent as a site manager for 35 years. Jennifer Tetchendorf, who is her assistant down there, will be replacing her. We will be hiring someone to replace Jennifer with the hopes that she be trained when we reopen winter, she will be, that person will become, he or she will become the site manager 
in winter and then we will then hire a part-time person for Chris once we open up and have breakfast again and a part-time person for Jen when she needs help and excellent. So that's, um, that's in the works right now. We did receive um, from France and Bank that the SBA forgave our payroll protection plan money that we got this last year. So that was good news. And I've included our financials. And if you look at our financials, we did quite well in 2020. We are um, out of debt. What our process is now and what we have to do, we have to start building up those reserves again. Um, because as our building ages and our sites need things, we need to have that money in reserve, something that we had to use um, in part to get out of debt. Um, so that's kind of where we're at in a nutshell. We will be having our Senior Resource Center board meeting tomorrow at the upper level of the Senior Center. If anyone is ever interested in coming to our meetings, they're always the first Wednesday or the third Wednesday of the month at 530 at the Senior Center. And we are doing them by Zoom and in person. And if anyone has any questions, I Sorry, I was taking some notes. Anybody have any questions for Joy? Thank you very okay. much, Joy. Right, and I will be at the meeting again next month because next month we'll have the final report for the 8521 grant because the 8521 financial report is due at the end of this month that Carol and I and Rows are working on right now. So we'll have that 8521 final report in April for the board. Um, I do have to leave for another Zoom meeting, but as always, if anybody has any questions, feel free to call the Senior Center, stop by, or come to one of our Senior Center um, board meetings. Thank you and have a good rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's it for committee reports. Adult long-term care. Tom requested on uh, the new agenda working with Lynn that we have um, a report for each of the units moving forward. So this is our first uh, attempt at it. Um, Lori wrote up a summary that you should have gotten on the long, adult long-term care unit. You can read that on your own, but I'll, I'll highlight a couple of things. Uh, and she notes that the staff um, just went completing their uh, functional screen test um, it's very intense and very stressful for the workers to take this thing. I think it's, it's every year or every two years. And um, if they don't pass it, they, can, they can't do functional screens. Um, and so like she said, she'll get the, uh, get the results at some at the end of March. And the other one is, um, you, may have, you may remember that there's three generations of ADRC. The first generation um, got a lot of funding. The second generation got a little less funding, and the third generation got the least amount of funding. When Sarah County became an ADRC, um, we're in the third generation. There have been talks for the last couple of years with WICSA and, and, and uh, as the Wisconsin County Human Services Association and WCA, Wisconsin Counties Association, uh, trying to work at getting more funding. Um, one of the things that, that wasn't going to work is the first generation counties did not want to give, or ADRCs did not want to give up money to make it more even. So they were hoping that the, that the state would give us more funding to make it to make it eat more even with all the other ADRCs. That doesn't seem to be in the budget right now. So, yeah. all right. And then Dell Protective Services, uh, she talked about they have this APS toolkit they just got and they're starting to learn how to incorporate it. And, um, Lori's been talking to myself. We've had Tom involved in some conversations about guardianships. There seems to be, uh, and coming from the um, nursing homes, a lot of requests for guardianships. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be working with court counsel about, you know, what is our responsibility for Sawyer County because it's becoming very burdensome on, on that unit to have to um, facilitate all those. And next month or the month after, we hope to become like some kind of proposal. Excuse me. No, this is just for the board. Okay, who is doing good justice? 
Pardon? You? Yeah, no, sorry. it's behavior health employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine, number nine. Yes, I'm sorry, behavioral health. Okay. You were just talking about child protective services, right? You know, we we're just yeah. talking about adult long-term care, and then See, that was all the subset that was was APS adult protection. Sorry, I mixed up. All right, Alicia um, wrote a pretty detailed report. I'd like to highlight a few things. CCS, we're still trying to recruit a uh, CCS facil service facilitator. Um, North Lakes, uh, after lots of conversations with them between the county and also Taylor County, has agreed to have one of the therapists be involved in CCS. And hopefully in April they'll be trained to be able to be able to engage them. Uh, I, I, my understanding is they want to try one therapist and see how that works, and then depending on the program expands, maybe have some other ones involved. Um, ideally, within the community, we get we get a number of um, therapists at the various clinics that want to be involved with different specialties. So when we have some somebody has a certain sort of diagnosis, you know, certain therapists are better at others and different diagnoses so but we're going to be using one for right now okay the CST program that's the coordinated services team um, our new uh, CST coordinator Haley is getting it up and running this year um, we've had um, I think two or three changes in the, the state contact person and each person has a different interpretation of how the CST program should be run and so we're at the point where we're, we're starting to get that implemented and redesigned and she's up to three families, and I think we'll probably cap it off, I think, around 10 when it gets going. And they have a um, review coming up, I think, in May or yes, in May. Uh, the children's long-term uh, support waiver. Uh, there's 40 children on that program right now. Um, the CLTS program is really fluid. There's a number of changes that are going on, and there's multiple, multiple meetings that uh, the CLTS staff, including the fiscal staff here at Sark County are involved in. And one of the big one is the waiting list. You might recall that um, not, not too long ago, the, the state took away the waiting list. And so we had, and so we ended up hiring another CLTS worker. Now they're going back to a waiting list, but the county's not gonna decide on who's on the waiting list. The state is gonna decide who, who's on the waiting list and, who, and when they come off. And they're gonna do that once a month. Right now, there's been lots of conversations with the um, Wisconsin, Wisconsin County Human Services Association with the state about, is there gonna be, if we have to take on more, more children, is there gonna be funding that's gonna go with that? I believe they assured us, but there's no, there's no, um, no nothing's been committed to. Um, so it's, the counties are very frustrated because if they're gonna, depending on how many people they release of the waiting list, are the counties prepared with enough FTE? Right. And if we have to have more FTE, where's the funding? So this has been debated, been, been debated for months on end, and, and nothing's been resolved. Um, that's it. And then Joe uh, also um, in here, uh, they updated the CLTS uh, brochure, and there should have been a copy that was sent to you to take a look at. And then Joe did a little uh, update on the, on placement. I can I'll just give you a, as good a summary as I can, but it's going to be as vague. It's going to be as vague as I'll get out. He and I have been having multiple conversations with the state in Winnebago about one particular placement, and um, we've talked about this multiple times. Right now, one of the placements might cost like 1.3 million dollars. We are looking at. Um, all kinds of options. Winnebago is pressuring us to get, to get them out of their states got involved. They're trying to pressure the county, blah, blah, blah. So Joe and I are talking to them. We are gonna, we are gonna get uh, court counsel involved, TJ. Uh, Joe has not been able to get him engaged yet, but he's hopefully sooner rather than later because I don't, I think we, based upon our conversations in here, I think we need to take a stand on this because one of the things that one of the things we talked about, as a matter of fact, we had a meeting yesterday. I said this small little county cannot cannot afford 1.3 million dollars. I can't explain I, because of confidentiality. I cannot talk about the stuff we're debating, but it's just like there there are. You heard me say this. There, there's gaps in the systems where this particular person just doesn't fall, and um, and I'm trying to parse out where's the county responsibility. 
So you got you know you got you got the service versus the budget tension going on and who's responsible for what. But um, lots of Zoom calls on this one. Well, I remember sometime in the past where we were always anxious to bring home people from Surrey County who are capable of living here, bring them out of Mendota. But we did that, and then we got dinged for not providing the services. Is that that's kind I, of like a double to, to, to answer your question, I'd, I'd have to go into I can't. I can't. I just, there's nothing I can no, say. No, no, no. I'm not okay. asking about the individual. Okay. I'm saying that if the state says we we don't want them in Mendota, so you have to take them home, and and we did, and then they the state dinged us because. We didn't have a plan in effect to take care for them. Yeah, I know which I know what, what person you're talking about. Too. Yeah, but it's so I, I don't want to talk about individuals, but the state wants it both ways, and that's I do well, not envy you your position. My concern, Mike, what Winnebago doesn't want the person there. The uh, um, the state's trying to back up Winnebago and have accountability on on the on the county. But if we just acquiesce and go, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go find a place we're gonna pay for it, then nothing gets resolved. And I don't know. This is where we need corp counsel because I don't know where our legal stand is and how. I don't I don't know I don't know well that well obviously I'm not an attorney. Um, so it's gonna have to go to that level, um, and they're really really pushing it. So we'll see. Anybody else? Any other comments? Anybody online? Okay, which one is next call? Child Protective Services. Okay. As promised, um, we should have gotten a report, um, a 2020 placement summary on, on, the, on the cost. And we have it broken up. Uh, by the way, Kathy Garvey, one of our clerical people that was assigned to CPS and YJ did a fantastic job, I think, putting this together. Um, she broke it up in three categories. We have foster care, residential care, subsidized guardianship, treatment foster care, and group home care. I had her break it out in, in terms of the LCO ones on here are the LCO placements placed by LCO. The county has no control over that. It's up to the LCA to do that. And usually those are kids that are on the reservation. If they're off the reservation, um, some of the ones that say Story County Health and Human Services may have been placed by the county, LCO okay. kids. But the ones that are on the reservation that say LCO are placed by LCO and we have no say in that. It's their decision. And so you'll see for each category the different costs and there's, there's some offsetting course costs that are noted on here. And then I had, then I asked Patty, what's, what's the best way to have the board digest this? And she suggested that we look at the 2020 budget and you should have another handout like this. And it shows you what we had budgeted for those placements and how far over budget we are for 2020. Any comments, questions, comments on that issue? And I'm, I'm thinking what we'll do if the board wants this is, and I talked to Kathy about this is, and we probably do this for mental health too, is to have a summary sheet as we go along the year, where we are with placement costs. So by next, next meeting, I should have a form like this that would go up through February, March, over part, you know, we're caught up. And so you guys will see that on a monthly, Basis, so it's not a sticker shot we look at a couple yeah. times a year. Where's where the one you were talking about with the with the budget? I didn't see the budget. It looks like this. This small It should be it would be this this one right here. It's up here. Yeah. Is that on there? Did you say that one? Oh yeah, no, I got it's it. Okay, PJT. PJT. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you can see the the RCC is the uh, is easily the highest cost.
That'd be the resurrection count. Yeah. You missed by half a million dollars. And you'll also notice in the um, the handout you have, we try not to put any identifying information there, just a, a round, rounded off their age and then how long they've been on each of these placements and then the cost. So. Mr. Chen? Yes. Just last year, do we have the same data from last year? Uh, I mean, not, not handy, but I mean, if we were like, we've been we've been playing hot table with a lot of these things like the mental health, uh, you know, legal fees in the county, things like that, where we're over substantially every year and we don't do anything about it. I applaud the way we're actually going after something reasonable with mental health because we're over every year. Why don't we actually plan for it? Uh, are we... Uh, is this an anomaly this year, or or is this status quo? Patty, you on there? I know it's Patty. Patty is. I don't have the other years in front of me. And, and I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I don't want to jump you on it. But I'm just trying to get my wrap my brain around a little bit. I don't have the um, information right in front of me, but I can get it in a second. Because with the budget pack that I give everyone every year, it actually gives 12 years worth of data. So I will pull that up. Mr. Chairman, do we, um, Patty, do we keep increasing that amount we put in the budget though? As we, um, as we realize that it is costing more than we've ever put in the budget? Well, not really. I mean, we sit and we talk about it, but if we start, even with uh, Winnebago, we aren't budgeting what we think it's costing, what it's going to cost, because there's not the money in. We'd be taking the entire county's money. I mean, all the money that's that's the the entire levy. And that's that's not this is Dale Patty. Uh, that's not entirely true, but I think it's great that we were spending about a million dollars and budgeting zero. Now we're spending a million dollars and at least budgeting uh, seven hundred thousand or something on that order. I think that's a wonderful thing, and I just want to make sure that we're looking at real numbers and not just ignoring them. So uh, I just I just wanted to get a little glimpse of that for myself. Okay. Let's just take RCC. In 2017, we spent 329,000. This is child welfare RCC, so that you're looking at apples to apples. In 2018, we spent 489,356. In 2019, we spent 489,662. Projected at the time of the budget, when I did the budget, the projected was that we were going to spend seven hundred and thirty-one thousand dollars. It had gone up dramatically. Our twenty twenty budget was three hundred and twenty thousand. Our twenty twenty one budget went to six fifty. So we are looking at each and everything and looking and taking them into consideration and bringing it up as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Within the scope of the county in general. So we're, we're making strides to get there. Exactly. Thank you, so, Yep. Mr. Chairman, I got a question for Paul. Paul, whatever came to that meeting we had with, with our Tabissa Mice and Carla, and we were discussing these other county placements for the children, especially the our native children. Sat with Dr. Dumma at the city and gave a report. And I remember bringing up that again, I'm, um, I haven't worked in RCT in years, but in my younger days, I worked, worked in a couple of them. And I remember that if anybody was there more than a year, a year and a half, it was really it's unusual. And, we have, and I don't, we have 
some kids here that have been here been in those places way longer. They're very expensive. Mm -hmm. And and one of the questions I asked, and I was, I was, is and to Bissom asked, she I think response was that she said they do. And I just was gently asking because I know our staff will will check on the placements and have regular contact with them um, to see what their progress is because we're always trying to get them out and, and step down from the RCC. And I just I think I asked her so to indicate somehow how often you have a she said we're having contact. So that's all I know. But because but I but I you know places like these if, if you're not if you're not having contact and 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 having conversations about about their progress and what the plan is for discharge, they'll keep them month after month. <laughs> and I know Carla and our unit, our unit, she keeps she keeps tabs on that, but I, I don't to the extent LCO does that. I don't know. It's a business yeah. such yeah. yeah. It's important for that so what, like no, 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 Switch your microphone. Oh, she is here. There you go. Carla, if you're there, I think Dale Schleter has a question for you or a comment. I didn't know she wanted to come. Hi, I'm here. Oh, I thought you wanted to be in on the conversation. Anything to add to the conversation? Um, I kept pretty quiet because the money part is the least of my concerns. I know for budget people, that's what you look at. I look at the emotional health of the children and staying in RCCs is not good. And um, let them stay there for longer than six to nine months. It goes downhill and when they are brought out of our CCs, they're so institutionalized, it's hard for them to transition back into the community well. Um, and the loss of their culture, the loss of their family, um, thinking on their own, being creative, just so much of their person is, is lost. And I just really, I know it's your job to look at the budget and you do a good job at that, um, but there's such a bigger picture to uh, these children um, being hosed away from their family. And that's all I wanted to add it is the other side to it. Thank you. May I ask a question? Carla, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Um, who determines the length of stay or out of placement? And when can that be changed or can it be changed and by an evaluation, say by you, or, or how does that work? Well, what I did as a worker, and I teach to the social workers now, is um, the minute you're placing, you're also looking for how to get them back home. And you're going out visiting with those kids, the birth parents. And I will say that the social workers do do a great job in my unit visiting with the children and the parents. And that they have a, their hand on the pulse of the case. Um, of course, at times, parents are dishonest. And so we got to keep um, checking in on um, and doing collateral contacts of is this really what's going on? And then we find out the parents um, still have some work to do so the kids can't go home. But um, that is a key to that. And then if a child is placed in an RCC, can they go down to a group home or to a treatment home, to a county foster home and keep 
them coming down the ladder of um, placements. So that's what concerns me too, is kids languishing in one placement too long. Okay. Child Protective Services. You just did that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Carla. You're welcome. Youth Justice. Yeah, Youth Justice. I've, I've lost my place here because I didn't get a packet for this. Youth Justice, uh, Brittany Haig, our uh, juvenile court intake uh, supervisor. Youth court. Um, put a summary together, and I think this is one that she will she will submit every month. She can kind of get a snapshot of what's going on. And this report comes out of EWSACUS. That's the uh, that's the database that we use for YJ and TPS. And this data comes from that. So um, I think most of it's self-explanatory. There's um, one out of hold placement for youth justice that's in Northwest. Um, they did one detention hold there for non-secure. That's usually not what, what the Oasis is used for, but it was convenient and they're able to do that. Um, and then they have um, in this report there's uh, there's a total of ten cases uh, with uh, four pending. So can we get for some of these with the truancy? That's the way I would read it. Okay. Any economic support? All right, Sean White, uh, supervisor there. Um, you know, written report from her. I'll highlight a couple of things. Uh, Emily Sumner, our new economic support uh, specialist, uh, started February 8th, and she's uh, involved in new worker training. And she's doing, Sean tells me, she's doing fine so far. And uh, I'll just note that she noted here that the Northern Income Means Consortium is launching a new employee website. And um, the employees are happy about it. Excited about it. And they're doing, uh, you know, um, so our con excuse me, the consortium is doing really well in the call center with the 99% answer rate. So being processed in a timely manner. And I think it's one of the highest, not the highest one in the state. So, so call is doing pretty good. Okay, I'm coming here. Start my video and oh, um, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. And we'll give you our PowerPoint. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Uh, here we go. Okay, so we are moving in the right direction, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, as a state, we are down to orange risk level from red. Um, that means that in orange, we have 10 to 24 cases per, per 100,000 per day. Um, and so for a state, we're at 10 and a half cases per 100,000 per day. And that's about 613 positive cases per day. And Lorraine had noted that testing is way down um, in the area, and we are noting that across the state. Um, however, um, testing is still readily available between the hospital and LCO. And we still have our phone line available where people can call in and get a test schedule for the next day. We will continue to do that. Testing is very important for our communities. It helps us identify if there are any new variant strains of COVID that are coming up. So we just do not want to stop testing. That's still important. Um, however, um, it is really nice to see those levels moving uh, down. For uh, Sawyer County, we definitely still have COVID in our community. 
Um, we are actually number four out of the 72 counties uh, within Wisconsin. So even though I feel like we're really dropping down nice and low, um, we still are at a point where we are um, higher than other counties within um, the state of Wisconsin. But we are moving in the right direction. And one of the things that is helping us get there is our vaccinations. Um, just so that everybody is aware, uh, people that are eligible for vaccine um, have changed as of March 1st. So the first um, up through the adults of age 65, as you can see on the screen, were eligible. And then this next round that came in March 1st were our educators in child care, individuals enrolled in Medicaid long-term care programs, we added utility and communications infrastructure, public transit, and, and this got added, um, but I just want everybody to be aware that we actually had all of our transit in with the healthcare personnel, because transit who actually um, help people get to their medical appointments were included in that healthcare personnel. So we were ahead of the game on that piece. Food supply chain and congregate living are the other areas that we're focusing in on. So uh, Lorraine had mentioned this as well, um, and I unfortunately did not take great pictures last Friday, but or I didn't take any pictures, let's, let's be honest here. Um, but LCO um, stepped up and really helped us with vaccinating the Hayward Area School District employees. Um, we did it in the gym, and this was the picture I could find of people in a gym. Um, we did it at the Hayward High School on last Friday. LCO uh, had 186 doses of vaccine available. The health center came with their employees who were able to vaccinate. And uh, Sawyer County Health Department helped to get all of the other pieces put together along with the Hayward School District. So um, we are very excited to be able to be moving forward. If we were going to actually have waited for our vaccine that wouldn't have come until the end of March, um, when the county would have received vaccine to vaccinate the school district. So we are very, very appreciative. Every dose that goes into an arm helps our herd immunity and, and it is beneficial for all of us in our communities. The other thing is, is um, LCO school has already been vaccinated and we do not want to forget about our winter school district and we will be going down as a health department to winter and this Friday in vaccinating the winter school district. And um, I've said this before that it takes a village to vaccinate to our communities and um, we can't forget that Hayward Area Memorial Hospital is also stepping up alongside with our health department at our weekly community clinics. So um, as we know, LCO is vaccinating their whole entire population. Lorraine has mentioned that um, 16 and older can now receive vaccine. We are still tied um, as a community that's receiving a vaccine from a state perspective to the, the guidance that I had just went through. Um, Memorial Hospital is vaccinating with us at our community clinic. And then on top of that, North Lakes is getting vaccine, Essentia is getting vaccine, Marshfield, Walgreens is getting vaccine. And those are going out to community members. Walmart and Marketplace, um, now that their employees are eligible, are also receiving vaccine and are focusing in on making sure their employees are vaccinated. And we'll wait to hear um, if that will be opening up to others as well. Wanted to share with you where we're at for vaccination rates. We um, have 23.6% of all of our residents in the county of Sawyer vaccinated. And that's with at least one dose of vaccine. One of the things I was really concerned about was opening up the vaccine um, to all of the other populations before 65 and older were vaccinated, but we are actually in a very good place right now. Um, as you can see on, on kind of those line graphs below, 57% of our, of our population who are 65 and older have been vaccinated. We don't know how many people actually want to receive a vaccine, but if we are getting close to 70%, we feel like that is actually a very good rate of the population getting vaccinated. 
So we are in a good place there. One of the other things, this, this is off of the state um, website. And I just want to make note that um, for the, the Native American population, it looks like just 9.2% has been vaccinated. What I want you to make note of is that 19% of the records have the race unknown. Um, so we probably are missing some of those race demographics because we know that the tribe has given a lot of vaccines out there. So um, we do think that that's just not a quite right indicator for us. And then this just shows that we are definitely making growth on the top line um, of the graph is the Sawyer County residents and the bottom shows Wisconsin residents. So we're definitely um, jumping up with the state of Wisconsin uh, very timely. So our allocations seem appropriate to us. And then finally, um, just wanted to say there is a lot, a lot of happy people out there. It is really nice to be uh, moving into the vaccine area, era um, and being able to have people be able to get out and connect with their families again. And, um, and just to reiterate um, what Dawn and Lorraine were talking about earlier with the masking, um, yes, people who are connecting with their loved ones at home and everybody's been vaccinated, you can go and start connecting with your grandchildren again. Um, but when we're in larger congregate areas at this point until we get more people vaccinated, the masking is still something that will take effect, but hopefully that will slide off as well. Um, as we can move into the summer and try to get our lives back again. Any questions? Julia, with those new strains that are coming through, what have you heard in Wisconsin so far? Uh, so far, the, the only variant, Lorraine, that we've had is that UK variant with the B117. And um, we've only seen that in less than 10 cases so far. And um, the vaccine is giving us coverage in that. One of the other things though, to speak to that um, with the variants, what we are finding is that they believe that the vaccine has better coverage on the variants than if you just had um, have immunity through actually having been uh, sick or having had COVID itself. Um, so they definitely are still saying that it would be important for you to receive the vaccine in order to help you cover all of those variants. So that's kind of one of the things that people have been questioning whether they should receive the vaccine despite the fact that they actually had COVID. Where was that at, Julia? Variants uh, was in, in Wisconsin. Yeah. Where, where was it at in Wisconsin? There was one in Eau Claire, and, and then, that was the first one. And you know, the other five, I do not recall which counties, but they were, they were kind of throughout. Not in our county yet. Yeah, Julie, I have a question. Um, how are the, our hospitals and clinics doing with our frontline workers and our doctors and nurses? Um, and we kind of, are we at a critical stage where, or do we have enough support in those areas now? Things are looking really good now. Um, one of the things that we get concerned about is when testing is really low, are people just choosing not to go in and get tested, but we still have a lot of illness in our communities. Um, we don't believe that's the case because we are not seeing the hospitalization rates that we were seeing before. So. Um, our goal and, and something that we're working at with the nursing homes and the hospital is to get to a point that we can start opening up actually to visitors coming in and how we can do that safely. So we are getting really close to actually getting to that. So that, that puts us in a much better shape, um, definitely not at that critical mode of beds um, and staffing at risk. Mm -hmm. And then Julia, have we seen a um, higher survival rate now with, with folks that might be presenting with um, respiratory problems since they've had maybe one injection or we have some herd immunity running through now? Is there um, any data on that? Yeah, there's data on that. I don't have data specific to our area. Um, I just have data in general because they are looking at that across the nation and actually across the world. 
And what they are seeing is definitely um, reduced hospitalization rates with people that typically would have been hospitalized and that would be 65 and older. And, and also reduction um, in the death rates as well. So, uh, and a very drastic reduction in deaths that are occurring of those that would have been vaccinated. So um, again, this is still new research um, and they are comparing that to the placebo that was given versus um, people that were fully vaccinated. But it is looking at this point um, with the variants that we have within, uh, in, the United States that the vaccine is being very effective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Has, anybody online? Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Julia. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. You too. Thank you. Let's go performance reports. Any concerns? No, no, no concerns. You know we're all concerned. Any questions? Nope. Yep. Future agenda items? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to mention the, um, I did attend the Health and Human Service uh, Department meeting last uh, couple weeks ago now, I guess. Uh, to discuss, you know, the agenda and how we present information to you. So I uh, appreciate Paul and your staff for um, putting some of these new reports together. I think the idea is to try and keep those things in front of you and get those statistics in front of you. And hopefully that'll generate questions. You know, if you do have something specific you want them to dive more deeply into, then we can use, you know, the future agenda item to bring that up and then we can get that on the agenda and get more detail to you if you need uh, information more, uh, more detail than you get in the, the, the statistical report. So, thank you. Anything else, folks? But, yeah, I, I guess I didn't. Is, is Patty still on? Maybe Paul can answer this too, or Tom. It seems like every year we're, we're like depleting our reserve fund within Health and Human Services to pay for these out of county placements that are way over budget every year. Um, what is the plan going forward? Because I don't think there's enough left in those reserve funds to cover another year of overage like we did. Yeah, our fund balance in Health and Human Services has actually increased every year uh, for the last five or six years, except for 2020. We took a major hit in 2020, as we had talked about and budgeted for. You know, the, the budget increase uh, in that line item in 2020 was essentially using fund balance, um, you know, to recognize that there is an issue there um, and we're depleting fund balance. Um, so yeah, the, the alternatives are, you know, there's always the push on legislation changes, which, you know, take forever and a day. Uh, and we're not seeing anything that's, that's really gonna help us uh, in, in the state budget specifically on that issue. There are a couple of things in the state budget that'll help us. There's the stimulus package at the Fed level uh, that'll give us some one-time funds, but that's not going to solve our problem, you know, on the ongoing maintenance costs. Um, and also, um, you know, the Wisconsin Counties Association every year has a Human Services Day at the Capitol. Um, that's scheduled for April 13th, between, what is it, nine and noon or something like that. Uh, the email just came out on that from the Wisconsin Counties Association. We can get that information out to you, but this this group um, might want to take a look at that and, and attend that. It's a Zoom presentation. Um, normally, we go down to Madison and talk to legislators individually. Um, but uh, this will be a Zoom presentation where WCA staff will, will talk about what's in the state budget, um, especially as it concerns mental health and some of these other issues that we have. And then we have the opportunity to schedule time with our uh, legislators in our area uh, to, to voice our concerns as well. So uh, last year, Paul's uh, department set that up and I think uh, you know, we, um, this department can help coordinate that this year, especially since it's Zoom, it'll be a little bit easier to coordinate, but uh, we can set up some time to talk to our legislators about these issues that we have. That's a great opportunity to do so. So put that on the calendar. Got it. Thank you. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. Okay. What, um, what, 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 what